Watch both sleeves. I take the black hanky and I place it into my left hand. Oh, you look upset. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're focused. This is how a lawyer focuses. Okay. You need another one of these. Okay. I say the magic word, which is on the wall behind me. It's up there. Oh, that, that's misdirection. Over here, focus. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and when I say the magic word, abracadabra, just like that, it vanishes from both hands. Did you see it go up this sleeve? Did you see it go up this sleeve? Uh, you have to watch really closely. It was this lead. You really have to focus. You have to focus. Yes. No, no. We're going to make it infinitely more difficult. Roberto, please place one hand on top of my sleeve, one hand on the bottom, and close my sleeve. Would you do the same thing? Ow, you're cutting off circulation. Do Relax. <laughs> like a bondage convention. Okay, good. Oh. <laughs> Not your first bondage convention. Huh? <laughs> what happens in the drama theater? <laughs> Oh, no, no, I want you one time. Yeah, yeah, don't let go. Okay, cowboy, hold on, okay. No, no, there's no waivers for this lawyer, okay? Relax. I, uh, you make sure it doesn't go up that sleeve. You're good, good. You make sure it doesn't go up that sleeve. And you know the magic word? It's over there. Uh, yeah, no, that was misdirection again. That, that was good. When I say the magic word, Abra and Abra, and I fall up so small, it vanishes from both hands. Did you feel it go up that sleeve? Did you feel it go up that sleeve? Okay, you can let go, you can let go, let go. When you are focused over there, it actually went up this sleeve. Weird, weird, but it's over there. Yeah! Did you feel like you up there? You did not. Pretty cool, huh? Right. Hey, big round of applause for number one. Right. Um, I want you to have a chance to feel it go up your sleeve, but I'm going to let you choose which hand, okay? So it's either going to go up this sleeve or that sleeve over there. It's totally, totally your choice. They give you these wristbands and everything. Yeah, now you're not the VIP anymore. Okay. <laughs> Tell me your name again. Tell me your name. Tom, Tom. Hold up in this hand so I can't see. Don't cheat. Use that hand. Turn your hand over. You got like a death grip lawyer. No, no, no. <laughs> Realize, Tom Free is going to be gone from here, and you get to choose this sleeve or this sleeve. Which one? Uh, that one? <laughs> Pick the hard one, you jerk. Okay, on three. One, two, three. Open your hand. Crap, I didn't wait. This is cool there. That's okay. That's okay. This is, I, I, sometimes magic doesn't always work the way you want to, but I came prepared. I brought along with me a pair of shackles. <laughs> Welcome to the Bravo Theater <laughs> on Halloween. <laughs> Pulse of last night. Thank you. <laughs> Locals got that one. <laughs> now these are European shackles, the same shackles they still use in Europe nowadays. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> European shackles are an 8-inch ring with four chains, two locks, and a key. 
Tom, I'm place the key right there. Let's hope we don't have to use that. Would you lock my right hand in there, cowboy? You know exactly what you're doing. You got a booth at Folsom Street Fair? What's going on? Come on the lock, make sure it locked. Let's do the same thing, but on the other side. Very good, but stay away from my watch. Some of the jokes are just for me, Tom. Once you lock the lock, pull it and make sure it did indeed lock. Now this is an escape illusion, similar to what Houdini used to do many years ago. Would you uh, face the audience? Keep facing the audience, but step to my left side. I'll move to the right side. Perfect. Now we make sure Tom the lock for Yeah, in the back of the room is a great big clock. You see that clock? Here, use the watch. That's your watch. Yeah. Still in there? Yes? Yeah, okay. My hands are turning blue. Now go put it on. Just hold it up in the light. The second you get this clock, you're going to say, I'm going to start to escape. Can you make sure I am still locked in there? In a loud voice, how many seconds? How many seconds? I want you to grab the key to make sure I can't get to it. Make sure I'm still locked in there. Yes, Tom? My hands are turning blue, Tom. This is, I need you to do a countdown from 10 when you get to zero. You say go, and I'll start to get out of these things. Nice and loud, so people will have you. I'm more focused over here. Come on, dude. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 7, 5, 4, 5, 5, Oh wow, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce myself. My name is Robert Strong. I am one of the co-producers of this evening's event. Thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> Allow me to give you 90 seconds, because you might be saying, why are you Robert Strong? And I will tell you why. Uh, the good news is we, hit, we made this work. It was a Kickstarter. You guys wanted to happen, so we're here today. The better news is no more Facebook posts by me about this event ever again. <laughs> The reason why me is I was a 12-year-old magician in 1985, and uh, I was so excited about magic that I carried magic with me everywhere we went. My mother, my father, my aunt and uncle are here today from the East Coast. A big round of applause to them because I would be here for the That's enough. We got a lot to do. Uh, they took me on a trip to meet my uh, grandparents. Again, not meet my grandparents, but to hang out with my grandparents. And I did a little magic show on the coffee table after dinner. And a aunt, an aunt Florence, pulled me inside and, did you, and she said, did you know that your great uncle inherited, collected all of Houdini's magic? I was 12 years old. That didn't land. <laughs> 30 years later, I'm in Maryland visiting my family and I said, I remember this story. Is this story true? Do you remember this story? They're like, I don't know, maybe. So I thought maybe it's exaggerated, it's a myth, I made it up in my head. And so I said, email every family member and see if we can find out if this is true. A day later, I get an email back saying, you're distantly related to Sid Radner. Sidney Radner was Hardeen's protege. And if I have the story right, because uh, we can get corrections here from Bill Radner, um, when Hardeen and Houdini passed away, all the notes, everything was to be burned, destroyed, and Sidney said, you know what, I'm going to celebrate and keep Houdini relevant. Let me take care of all this stuff. And he did, and here we are, 89 years later, and this is the night we're gonna speak to Houdini. So now it's my honor to introduce our historian. He has made a 40-year study of the life of Harry Houdini. He consults for radio, television, stage, and film. He writes a popular blog called Wild About Harry. He's a graduate of USC, and he has written for film, television, and he's a uh, member in good standing at the legendary Magic Castle. Please put your hands together for John Cox. Happy Halloween. Hello. It's fun to see so many people uh, dressed up. Okay, and um, as I said, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, my favorite topic, and that is Houdini. Woo! <laughs> that doesn't look like Houdini. Well, of course, that's Tony Curtis from the 1953 movie Houdini, or what I call the biblical version of Houdini's life. <laughs> up because this is usually the first Houdini that we meet, and this was the first Houdini that I met when I was 10 years old. In fact, um, the anniversary is coming up 40 years uh, in two weeks that I saw this movie. 
And I decided I needed to learn everything I could about this man. And one of the first things I wanted to know was what did the real Houdini look like? <laughs> I was not disappointed. <laughs> okay, Houdini was born Eric Weiss in Budapest, Hungary, March 24th, 1874. When he was four years old, the family immigrated and they landed in Appleton, Wisconsin. Houdini always claimed that he was born in Appleton. He wanted to be known as first-generation American. When his father, who was a rabbi, lost his job in Appleton, the family drifted, and eventually they wound up in New York City, where the teenage Eric Weiss indulged his true passion, which was athletics. He was actually a champion runner, boxer, and swimmer. But then he read a book that he bought by mistake. Thinking he bought, was buying a book on magic tricks, he actually turned out he bought an autobiography of a great French magician named Robert Houdin. And it captivated him. He decided he wanted to make magic his life. A friend and co-worker told him if he added an I onto the end of the name Houdin, it would mean in French, like Houdin. Probably not correct grammatically, <laughs> but it was good enough for someone with a uh, fourth grade education. And at that moment, Eric Weiss became Harry Houdini, magician. Now, he originally performed an act with his brother, the brothers Houdini. That was until they were performing in Coney Island, and he uh, met this little lady. Her name was Wilhelmina Beatrice Rahner, or just Bess. And after knowing each other only for a week, a whirlwind courtship led to a new partner and a new wife. Now, as the Houdinis, they struggle for a good long six years performing in tent shows and, uh, and, uh, and spiritualist revivals and um, even traveling circuses. This is them with the Welsh Brothers Circus, which toured in Pennsylvania. There they are sitting there. And Harry had to double as the wild man in the circus. <laughs> but it was while he's working in a dime museum that he developed a new act. He challenged anyone, $50, to produce a pair of handcuffs that he couldn't free himself from. And he was always able to escape. Eventually, this gentleman saw the act, Martin Beck, who ran the powerful Warfield Vaudeville circuit. And he took Harry aside and gave him some excellent advice. He told him to drop all the magic, the cards, the hodgepodge that he had put together over the course of six years, concentrate exclusively on the challenge of uh, handcuff act. And if he did that, that would be a good title of vaudeville turn, and he would try him out on his circuit. But he took the advice, and at that moment, Harry Houdini, king of cards, became Harry Houdini, king of handcuffs. <laughs> One of the first cities booked him in was San Francisco. He arrived in 1899, and he announced his, uh, his act by challenging the local police to shackle him. He freed himself. It was really in San Francisco that he got some of his first real recognition. In many ways, you could almost say that the meaning kind of got his start here in San Francisco. Of course, he exaggerated a little bit. He took out ads in, news, in uh, Magic Magazine saying that he had created the biggest sensation in California since the discovery of gold in 1849. <laughs> but he didn't need to exaggerate what happened next. He traveled to Europe and he became a true sensation. Britain, Germany, France, even Russia went just absolutely wild for this young American who seemed to free himself from any restraint. In Glasgow, they actually rushed the stage and carried him on, his on their shoulders all the way back to his hotel, where they wouldn't leave until he came out and gave a speech. When he returned to America, he had added jailbreaking to his act. And he challenged the, the uh, prisons of Boston and also Washington, D.C. And what they would do is they would strip him naked. A doctor would search him to make sure he had no keys or picks. He'd been then manacled and locked in their strongest cell. Well, not only would he escape the manacles and the cell, he would then run around and open all the cells and switch all the prisoners from one cell to the next. <laughs> he then scaled the wall, jumped in a car, and sped away, and he would call the warden from the theater as he was about to go on stage. <laughs> but with success came imitators, and soon Houdini was faced with a legion of handcuffed kings and even handcuffed queens. In fact, the boyhood friend who had suggested his name started performing himself as, believe it or not, Professor Houdini. <laughs> so Houdini gave up the, the handcuffs, and instead he evolved the Challenge Act in a bold new way. Now it was anyone could challenge him with any restraint that they could come up with or even invent. And this led to lifeguards challenging Houdini, and brewers challenge Houdini, physicians challenge Houdini, suffragettes challenge Houdini. <laughs> 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 
He actually said this was one of the toughest escapes he had he had ever he'd never been tied so securely. <laughs> so he was escaping from safes, tied to a stake that was then set on fire. He nearly burned himself to death during this one. But probably the strangest challenge he ever accepted was he was sewn inside of a giant sea turtle that had washed ashore in Boston. <laughs> You can see here that the press called it a sea monster. He actually almost passed out because of the fumes that they used inside to embalm the creature. He also upped the odds by creating his own original escapes in which failure meant death, and he wasn't kidding. It started with the milk can escape in 1908, something that some of his imitators tried, and actually people have died in this escape. But when he found that this was being imitated, he invented his true masterpiece, the Chinese water torture cell. Now, he, who did he would announce himself in town by performing outdoor escapes? Notably being tied up in a straitjacket and hung, sometimes 100 feet up, above, above the uh, pavement. He actually did that in San Francisco, on the corner of 3rd and Market, the old Hearst building, which I wouldn't saw today. And when he would do such stunts, he would draw crowds that look like this. The San Francisco papers reported that 30,000 people actually packed uh, the streets. Alternately, he would be shackled and nailed inside a sturdy packing crate. It would be weighed down and then sunk into the harbor. Again, he did that uh, 100 years ago, this month, um, in San Francisco Bay. And after a few agonizing moments, Houdini would appear, and what would happen all the tugboats would then blow their horns, alluring all the people on shore, telling them that Houdini had gotten free. Pretty, pretty spectacular. Now, it should, it, sometimes you'll hear that Houdini was primarily a skate artist, not a magician, but it's not really true. He did magic his entire career. Of course, being Houdini, it had to be Houdini scale magic. So instead of producing doves, he produced what he claimed was an American bald eagle, <laughs> named Abraham Lincoln, made an elephant disappear in the hippodrome, walked through a solid brick wall, and even though he only did this for a week at Hammerstein's Victoria, he's actually still known as the man who walked through walls today. And if you asked someone at the time to name a famous Houdini feat, they were just as likely to name the needles effect as they were the Chinese water torture cell. This would affect what Houdini would appear to swallow needles and thread and regurgitate them, threading. <laughs> but as the 20s loomed, again, competition. Here he is with comedian Fanny Arbuckle, who you see there, he's doing his own version of Houdini's needles. <laughs> That's because movies were becoming the popular entertainment of the day. Replacing vodka, where Houdini really spent most of his career. So Houdini became a movie star. He started off in a 15-part movie serial called The Master of Mystery, in which he battled bad guys and this happy fella. <laughs> That's Q the Automaton, which is said to have been the first movie robot. <laughs> He also went to Hollywood and made two feature films with Jesse Olasky at Paramount. Olasky was the biggest producer at the time. He later formed his own production company and made two more films. Houdini felt very good about his uh, movie career, and he even modestly said of his own acting ability, they say I'm the most sincere actor on the screen. Hmm. Of course, his producer, Jesse Olasky, had a different assessment. He did his best acting handcuffed and locked in a trunk at the bottom of a river. <laughs> and truth be told, Houdini's movie career never really did take off. But that was okay, because by the mid-twenties he had found a new passion that he was perfectly suited for. And this was exposing the tricks of fraudulent spirit mediums. Now he had been interested in, in uh, spiritualism really since his earliest days of magic. And it's, you sometimes hear that his mother's death made him uh, go after his mediums. But it really wasn't until ten years after she died and he got friendship with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, that he began this crusade against fraudulent mediums. Uh, another speaker's going to talk more about that, so I'm actually going to leave that to him. And instead, I'm going to jump us forward to 1925, when Houdini achieved what he said was a lifelong dream. He launched a full evening show made up of magic, escapes, and fraudulent mediums exposed. And he even brought Bessie back into the act, and they did their trunk track like they did when they were young. His 1926-27 tour was going to be a coast-to-coast -coast tour. Very likely he would have come to uh, San Francisco, and I don't know for sure, but this being a legitimate house at the time, it's possible he may have booked his, uh, his show here. But he would never make it. 
In October 1926, when he was performing in Montreal, he had given a lecture at McGill University, and he met a couple students. He invited them to visit him backstage. And while they were talking, a third student joined in, J. Gordon Whitehead. A little bit of an oddball. The other students didn't know him. This is an actual sketch done by one of the students of that uh, sitting. And Whitehead, here on the end, really dominated, began peppering Houdini with all kinds of questions. Eventually, he asked him if it was true if he could be punched in the stomach and withstand the blow. Houdini said yes, that was true. Whitehead took it as an invitation, leapt up, and started hitting Houdini hard several times. Houdini was experiencing great pain on the train ride to Detroit, the next stop. A doctor was cabled, met him at the theater, the Garrick Theater in Detroit, and suggested that he go to the hospital, but it was sold out, and Houdini went on stage anyway. He performed with a 104 degree temperature in what turned out to be a completely ruptured appendix. He finally uh, let himself be taken to the hospital, Grace Hospital, where an operation was held. Uh, but nothing could be done. He lingered for several days and then died on Halloween 1926. Now, who did he left behind? A widow, little Bessie, and a rich legacy. And it's not really true that Houdini promised to come back from the dead. Again, that kind of comes from the Tony Curtis movie. But what he did say that if it was possible, he would certainly be the man that would be able to figure out how to do it. So he and Bessie came up with a code that, she could, uh, that, that he would identify himself should he come back. And it was made up of code words that spell the word believe. She tried on and off for 10 years, and then famously held what she called the final Houdini seance on the roof of the Hollywood Knickerbocker Hotel. And when Houdini didn't come through, she told reporters afterwards, 10 years is long enough to wait for any man. <laughs> <laughs> but others were willing to give Harry more time. His brother Hardeen, for instance, began to carry on annual seances. He passed the tradition on to this young fella, Sidney Radner. And Sidney continued on the tradition of the official Houdini seance all the way to 2011 when he passed away. This is a picture of Sidney in one of the final years. And you see there a handcuff that he's holding. That was a handcuff that Houdini had custom made himself. He called it the Hungarian manacle, but today we call it the seance cuff because it's the handcuff that Houdini said that he would unlock if he came back from the dead. Sidney brought it to every seance. After his passing, his son Bill, and also Tom Bolt, who was very instrumental in all the seances throughout the 80s, picked up the tradition. And this year, he's teamed with San Francisco's own Robert Bolt. And they brought the official Houdini seance to the Brava Theater tonight. So that story that started in Budapest really has a direct line right into this room tonight. Now let me finish by going back to the Tony Curtis movie. There's a great scene where Houdini is trapped under the ice of a frozen river. The current has dragged him downstream during an escape. He can't find the opening. And slowly, the press and public give up and walk away. No one could survive. It dissolves to this shot, which I love, of his assistant standing and waiting, long past the time that Houdini would be able to survive. And that kind of reminds me about what's going on here tonight. I look at that hole, and I almost think of that as a seance table the darkness that Houdini has failed to find. And when I look out at this audience, it's not one person, it's 350 of us standing by. It's been 89 years, that's a long time, and all logic suggests that we should probably all turn and go home. But Houdini was the man who escaped death again and again, and he tended to do it at exactly the most dramatic moment. So here we stand, waiting, watching, wondering, and maybe even believing that tonight, Harry Houdini will emerge from that darkness and once again take center stage. Ladies and gentlemen, John Cox! It's amazing that Houdini can sell out houses 89 years after his death. <laughs> and you're all part of that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to set up the seance table. Don't mind those men behind the curtain. Um, while they do that, I'd like to move something up here to this director. I'd like to invite everyone in the audience to think of a playing card. 
not just one playing card, change your mind a few times, so that you land on a playing card that is truly a free choice. I'm going to arbitrarily pick somebody, the, maybe the first person I look at, they pick somebody else, they pick somebody else, the third person is going to come up on stage. We'll give them a big round of applause. Uh, let's see, um, uh, you on the end with, it looks like tattoos on your arm? Pick somebody else. Pick somebody else. Yeah, now you pick somebody else. Well, we got two people, lots of tattoos in San Francisco, what are the odds? <laughs> let's start with the lady with tattoos. You pick a second person. Okay, you pick a third person. And that person will come up on stage. Yeah, the red. Guy in red. Pick a third person. Oh, you picked him! Okay, guy in red, come here. A big round of applause for this guy. Pick him up on stage. The closer you get to the stage, the more they will applaud for you. What is your name, sir? David, would you face the audience? You notice I have a, play, a deck of playing cards here. I am going to thumb through it, and there's only one card that is upside down. Would you verify that? That's the only upside down card in the deck, yes? Sure, like. Would you take that card without looking at the card? Look at the audience, and for the first time in a loud voice, when I ask you to think of a card, what card were you thinking of? Seven of clubs. The seven of clubs. Look at that card. So tonight we're going to hold a seance, which nowadays is a, an intimate small spare circle, okay? Modern day mediumship is more mental than physical, and with our time constraints and just the general skeptical environment that we're in, <laughs> <laughs> the odds of any ectoplasm or transfiguration or anything like that are very low, so I don't want to mislead you with any of that, okay? But we don't know what spirit has in store, and we do have a millimeter on the table, which does measure any energetic or temperature changes. So if that goes off, that'd be really cool. Um, okay, great. Now, with that said, Mr. Houdini can deny our invitation, okay? But as a medium, I don't turn any spirit away, okay? So I go ahead and I honor that communication. So when we do our circle tonight, I want us to look at the information that I give to you all as in two sort of directions. One is for Houdini, and one is for you. Perhaps one of your loved ones will come through with a message as well, okay? So let's think kind of duality here. Um, also, I don't want you to feed me any information, okay? So simply, if I ask you any questions, just loudly, well, that's fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> really? <laughs> Um, and so just, if I ask you any questions, just please clearly and loudly say yes, no, or I don't know, okay? If you say I don't know, that's fine, take that information, put it in the back of your head, you'll probably remember it tomorrow and know what I'm talking about. If it's no, I could be um, communicating, not directly or exactly, you know, what needs to go on, and also possibly interpreting the information wrong. If it's also a no and I'm wrong, I'm okay with it being wrong. It's fine, the medium is 100%, I'm not 100%. Um, so with that said, um, if, there are, if there is time for any questions at the end, they'll be fielded at the end from you guys, okay? Also, we're gonna be building a circle of energy here, okay? So please, um, if I ask you a question, then go ahead and say something. Um, and also from the audience, please let's not disrupt this circle of energy that we're, that we're you know, building and we're, we're coming. So with that said, let's get started. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, sure, if you want to. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> this is good. Okay, so what I wanted to do is just to quickly, we're going to do three deep breaths. So I want to change the energy around here, okay? Spirit likes to be welcomed and not tested. So um, let's go ahead and see what we can do. So. Um, the first thing that I'd like for everybody to do is just take your hands and just place them lightly on the table. If you have to clear your throat or you have an itch that you need to scratch, go ahead and do it. Take care of your physical cells. You're just fine. You will not be interrupting that. Um, when I ask questions, just raise. You can raise one hand, and that's fine. That won't be breaking the circle either. Um, if you can take the information that I give you, okay? And um, I think we're just pretty much ready to go. So we're going to take three deep breaths. We're going to inhale, hold, and then exhale. 
okay? And I will guide us all with that, okay? So if we're ready, we'll go ahead and do that. The first one, we'll keep our eyes open. The next two, we'll keep our eyes closed, okay? So if everybody can please take in a deep breath in, hold it, and now exhale. Good, thank you. Now everybody close your eyes, please. Take in a nice deep breath in, hold it, and now exhale. Last time, inhale in, hold it, and exhale. Good, thank you. You can open your eyes now. Find a comfortable breathing pattern for yourself. It's at this time that I would like to invite Mr. Houdini to come forward. I want to keep the invitation extended throughout the seance in case he doesn't show up right away, okay? Um, also, any spirit that is around here, um, if you can, um, if you would like to conjure up enough energy to set up that mail meter that is placed right over there, that'd be fantastic. Go ahead and do that. Excellent. Okay. So I do feel some energy coming through, actually. I do feel that it's a male. And I feel, okay, thank you. So I feel as if this male is not only a son, but he is an uncle. Okay, so I'm just going to give you that information. And I also feel that um, I feel that he's bringing through a woman as well. The woman feels older than him, and it feels like there's a relationship of a mother, which would make sense if the son. <laughs> um, thank you. And I get the sense that this male's personality outwardly is gregarious and actually, on some level, egotistical. Inwardly, he feels like he needs to sort of cocoon himself. So, so far with this information, can anybody resonate, or does any of this information make sense with their knowledge of Houdini? Does this make any sense? This makes sense to you, and that makes sense to you? Okay, and what about personally? Do you know somebody with this who is you do. Okay, thank you. Um, don't, you can say yes. It's okay. <laughs> you can talk. That's fine. Okay, great. So we have that. Let me see. See, what, what's interesting is that these two energies are coming in together, the son and the mother. As a matter of fact, thank you very much. I just heard from the mother that she had two sons. Does this make any sense in regards to Houdini having, Houdini having a brother? Because I almost feel like this, I do feel that this male that has come through his mother is telling me that she had two sons. Does that make sense? He's like, I don't know. You're, no. No, okay. Any other takers along that line? It's not me. You work still with you. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, what's interesting, okay, so, again, this woman seems to be more talkative. Does that make sense to you that the woman would talk? Because I feel like the woman is actually talking, but the son is just kind of along for the ride. Would that be the personality or would that be the relationship between the mother and the son, where she would talk a lot more and then he would just kind of go along for the ride? That doesn't make any sense. Okay. That's okay. Um, I do feel like this woman is actually a lot more prevalent than this man. I will say that. Um, okay, let me see if she's uh, describing herself to me. Thank you. She's actually talking to me versus giving me the feeling in the sense. Okay, great. Thank you. So she's telling me, she's telling me there's a connection to food or there's a connection to her always having to feed her family. Does that make any sense to you? Providing. Can you please speak up? Like, yes. No, that makes sense. Okay. And it, it, she's giving me the sense. Thank you. Hold on a second. I want to find out what her connection is to you. Um, would it make sense to you if I say um, aunt? That makes sense. Okay, thank you very much. Um, would it be correct if I say that this was on your mother's side? Does that make sense to you? This, is, this would be your mom's sister. Does that make sense to you? That does. So affirm yes. Okay, great. Thank you. She's um, drawing my attention to my chest area. Does that make any sense to you? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not saying that's how she crossed over. I'm just saying she's pointing out to her chest. As a matter of fact, what's very interesting to me is um, 
<laughs> she's kind of going like this. Okay, so uh, it was to me, she's giving me the sense that there was some pride in her chest. Does that make sense to you? Okay, and she's giving me, <laughs> hey, you know, if you've got it, flaunt it, right? <laughs> um, she's giving me a letter. <laughs> I'm going to give you the letter. So just think of the connection to the letter. It may not be her name, but there's a connection to her in this letter, and it's A. Does that make any sense to you? Okay, that makes sense to you. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, I, I feel confident enough to say that I'm with your aunt. <laughs> um, and um, right now I have to say, honestly and truly, that I do not feel that Houdini is with us at this moment. Remember, I gave him an opportunity to show up, so maybe he will Okay, great, so your aunt. So let me, let me find out why she decided to come through, because most of the time spirits will come through for a reason, and I like to give the message. So thank you very much. She's acknowledging a house. Okay, so would it be correct in saying that there is, uh, okay, thank you, there are changes within the house. Does that make any sense? Or the homestead, I want to say homestead, within the family, the family homestead. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Um, she's saying she's acknowledging it, and she's saying, okay, thank you. She's saying that the, the direction that it's being moved in, whatever it is, needs to continue on that path. It's a bumpy road right now, but she's saying she's giving me the month of September. I'm just going to give that to you. I don't know if that's a, if you know of that connection. It's okay if you don't. Again, just file it in the back of your head tomorrow. You might know what that means. But I almost feel like this situation with the homestead, she's giving me September. So I am, uh, it, 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 she's giving me the sense that it, everything will be completed by September. Okay? So I'm just going to go ahead and leave that with you. Thank you. Wow, I've got another female coming in. It looks like the women want to talk. Anybody surprised? <laughs> okay. Um, this female, um, okay, what's interesting about this female is she's, she has an underlying sadness to her, okay? Um, but that's too vague for me. I'm not happy with that. Um, she's drawing my attention to the left side of my body. Oh, that was me. Sorry. She's drawing my attention to the left side of my body and actually specifically in this area. Now, again, I'm not saying that she crossed this way, but what I am saying is that there's, she's drawing my attention. Actually, it feels more over here. So, and I feel that it is a mother, a mother figure, a mother. So, does anybody here at the table have a mother in spirit? who had some, um, I want to say, an issue with the neck. Um, and that's not necessarily how she crossed over. Does that make sense to anybody? No? OK. So I'm, um, let me see if I can get some more information. I'm actually really hoping it's for someone at the table and not in the audience. <laughs> um, Great. Now, there's something about her stature, okay? So what she would do is she would stand very, very tall, and when she walked, there was a, there's almost a sultry type of walk to her. So with that information, can anybody take that, a mother who's in spirit, in addition to possibly having attention to this area, would walk in a very sultry way. And she's showing me herself when she was younger, and that she would have attention from men. So does anybody at the table, does that make sense? No, not even an I don't know. Okay, so let me see. Um, I could be wrong. Or let me see if I'm. Um, uh, and there's a connection to airplanes or air air flights. I don't know why I'm going to say air flights. Um, flight attendants. Does that make any sense to anybody? No. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and let her go because I want to make sure it's for someone at the table. Okay. I have a male coming through. Thank God it's a male. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're back to feel and back to feeling an ego. Okay, so this is a gentleman who has an ego. This is a man, okay, there's something prominent about his ears. Okay, because he's showing me his ears and he's going like this. Okay, so we're going to go back to could this possibly be Houdini? Um, there's something about his ears, is very prominent about his ears, and um, even hearing. Um, he's giving me the sense that he would have good hearing. Um, and hold on, I want to make sure I get a relationship here. 
and I feel like this, he, again, the word brother is coming up. So he's giving me the sense that he is a brother, which means he has, or he is a brother. Does that make sense in terms towards Houdini or towards anybody here? He had brothers, okay. Anybody else? Something about the ears, being prominent about the ears, having very good hearing, and then he'd go, no, okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'm gonna see if I can come up with one more piece of evidence, and if not, I'm just gonna go ahead and say, um, unfortunately, we didn't <laughs> contact the team tonight. Uh, let me see, um, uh, the color red and red hair, is there a connection to this gentleman in your own life or in a Houdini connection to having red hair. Does that make sense to anybody? <coughs> that could be an I don't know, or is that, that's a definite no? Is that an I don't know or an I don't know? Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay, that's fine. Okay, all right, well, at this time, my time is almost up, so I am very confident in saying that we did not contact Houdini tonight. And um, it's a shame that we didn't. And um, I just wanted to thank you all so much for coming tonight. And thank you for sharing your loved one with me. I'm glad you got a message. <laughs> That's the way spirit works. We never know what's going to happen. So thank you all very much. And um, I hope you all have a great rest of your evening. I'd like to everyone to focus on the center of the spiral. Do not look away. Keep your focus on the center. Breathe naturally. Use your peripheral vision to see the whole spiral. Try not to look away. Try not to blink. Breathe naturally. We'll clean the uh, stage. Yeah. This is the misdirection for that. Focus over here. Breathe naturally. I'm going to count down from 10. When I get to zero, I would like you to look at my nose. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Did you see it? What happened? The head got bigger. Now I've just switched the direction of the drill. Now what's happening is, uh, if there are any doctors or medical people in the audience, is your eye is adjusting and pulling to one side and those muscles fatigue. When those mu muscles get really fatigued and you stop uh, 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 stressing them out and you look someplace else, it overcompensates by going the other direction. You get an optical illusion like that. Our next act is going to talk about that. But first, I'd like everyone to watch the center of the spiral go the other direction. I will count down from 10. When I get to zero, look at my nose. And exactly the opposite will happen. 10, breathe. 9, concentrate. 8, focus. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the world's premier escape artist, Harry Houdini. Ladies and gentlemen, in interest to you, my original invention, the water drop itself, although there is nothing supernatural about it, I raised a bucket of sum of one thousand dollars to anyone who can prove that it is possible to obtain air inside of the drop itself when I'm locked up in it in the regulation manner after it has been filled with water. So 
the inspiration. Jean Dujan will know that. Well, Doyle liked the book, he apparently was troubled by a passing statement that he made to the effect that the Davenport brothers were strictly performers and not genuine spirit mediums. Now, the Davenports were a successful stage act at the time. A pair of performing brothers toured throughout the United States and England, uh, parts of Europe, performing a stage version of spirit manifestations that occurred in especially a closed wooden cabinet inside which the brothers were suitably bound in the chairs by ropes, but nevertheless all sorts of mysterious and entertaining phenomena would occur. They were professional performers who left it to the audience to decide if they were genuine or not. They were not. <laughs> but Doyle, like many spirituals, believed that that, of course, was a genuine thing and wrote a letter to Houdini in which he expressed this thought. This thought, Houdini, eager to continue a correspondence, perhaps open up genuine friendship with a respected literary celebrity and public intellectual like Doyle, downplayed his own kind of soft soul, his own strong skepticism. He didn't agree, he didn't say anything that wasn't true, but he, but he, he, he used sort of careful language um, and answered judiciously and cautiously. So the friendship would actually flower for a while with a lot of correspondence, active correspondence, visits between the two families, uh, but would eventually flame out in about three years uh, into actually a public feud at times. Now, although the actual break between the two men didn't occur uh, until the spring of 1923, a serious crack in the fissure of their relationship took place in June of 1922, two years, about two years into their friendship, when the Houdinis were visiting with the Doyles and the Doyles' children in Atlantic City. Now, Cunning Doyle's wife, Lady Jean, uh, had been experimenting a little bit as an amateur with mediumship, specifically automatic writing. The spirit rates through the hands of the medium. And Connie Doyle urges to to come to the Doyle's hotel suite for an attempt at an automatic writing seance, in which the spirit goes. And who did he agree? And what followed would eventually become a bitter bone of contention between the two men. Despite disputes in their accounts, there seemed to be little doubt of several key facts, including when the seance began and the spirit first seemed to make its presence known, Lady Doyle drew the sign of the cross on the letter paper. And when the spirit made itself known, being that of none other than Houdini's mother, she continued to write through Lady Doyle's hand until 15 pages of note paper were filled. Now, after this, in the, in, in the aftermath, the Doyle's considered the seance a success. Houdini thought otherwise. And while he kept much of his own counsel for a time, not wishing to offend the Doyle's, and understanding that Lady Doyle was sincere in her beliefs, nevertheless, the seance had been a ludicrous failure, among other things. Those 15 pages were written in English, and Houdini's mother spoke only Yiddish. Couldn't <laughs> manage more than a few broken words, a few words of broken English at best. She also did not address Houdini as Eric, the only name that she ever used for him. Uh, and as to making the sign of the cross, Houdini's father had been an Orthodox rabbi. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. So Arthur Conan Doyle would one day write, quote, who was the greatest medium baker of modern times? Undoubtedly, Houdini. Who was the greatest physical medium of modern times? There are those who would be inclined to give the same answer. Close quote. And there you have it. A difference of worldviews that could not go, could not be resolved, and would eventually end a famous friendship. But despite the eventual conflicts between Conan Doyle and Houdini, their relationship had served a significant purpose that would carry, would remain a driving force in Houdini's life for the rest of his life, uh, namely his passion for investigating psychic phenomena and debunking psychic fraud. By 1924, he'd signed on with a lecture bureau to tour, presenting not magic and escape shows, but rather public lectures about spiritualism, including demonstrations of the methods of mediums, some of which he had discovered and exposed himself. Now, also in the spring of that same year of 24, Houdini published his book, A Magician Among the Spirits, which included a recounting of the history of modern spiritualism and detailed explanations of the methods of spirit mediumship. And 1924 was a busy year in many ways for Houdini, particularly on that spiritualism front. In January of that year, Houdini was asked by Scientific American magazine to join a newly created committee composed of scientists and intellectuals and two magicians intended to investigate psychic phenomena, thus essentially giving birth to the study of parapsychology as an alleged science. Uh, the magazine proposed offering two prizes of $2,500 each to the first person who could produce either, quote, an objective psychic manifestation of physical character, close quote, or a psychic photograph or spirit photograph, which was another popular phenomenon of the spiritualistic age, generally produced by double exposures. 
in New York and still rather mysterious technology of photography. So uh, the committee starts up and after examining a few early applicants and little result, the committee and the committee's role would end up becoming front page news for many, many months due to its extended study and eventual controversies over the, with the Boston medium, Marjorie Crandall. So Ms. Crandall, the wife of a wealthy doctor, was a remarkably talented medium of this, there is no doubt. While convincingly constrained in the seance chamber, she was able to produce remarkable phenomena of many sorts, objects moving, spirits whistling in the dark, whispering to and even touching sitters, uh, ringing a spirit bell, especially a built into a wooden box. And she was able to convince some members of the committee, those who were already inclined to believe in the general notion of physical mediumship, and who knew, not, knew nothing of the methods of professional deception. This was intensely frustrating to me, who knew that all the academic training in the world doesn't help prevent smart people from being fooled by con artists or magicians. Robert and I don't only get paid to fool the dumb ones. <laughs> And in fact, if you're going to study people who want to fool you, you need an expert. This was really the Dean's point. In other words, it takes one to catch one. As the months of investigations dragged on, the Dean was desperate to make certain the committee did not declare Marjorie the real thing and award her a prize, which the Dean would have regarded both as an outrage and as a public humiliation for his own involvement. Now, eventually, the scientific American Committee would deny Marjorie the prize, claiming insufficient evidence that her manifestations were genuine. It was tepid language, and the result didn't entirely satisfy Houdini. But even before the committee issued its long awaited report, Houdini began offering a $10,000 personal prize of his own for physical evidence of the afterlife that he could not duplicate or explain. This prize, in turn, would inspire half a century later James the Amazing Randy, the most famous skeptic and psychic debunker of our own time, to offer what began as a personal prize of $10,000 for any paranormal ability to perform under mutually agreed upon test conditions. And that eventually became the Randy Million Dollar, she found, uh, sorry, Million Dollar Challenge, which I helped supervise for the past decade. Uh, can you prove you talk to the dead? I might have a million dollars for you. Oh, no tickers. Um, with this brief account, I have only skimmed the surface of Harry Houdini's adventures as a psychic investigator and crusader against psychic fraud. But one more story must be told. As John Cox recounted for 10 years, Bess Houdini held a seance every Halloween with never a sign from her husband. And yet, Harry Houdini did manage to escape some of the constraints of mortality. His name lives on as the very de definition of escape. Magicians today still invoke his name as a measure their own worth. At the final Houdini seance, October 31st, 1936, from the rooftop of the Hotel Nicaragua in Hollywood, the medium, Dr. Edward Saint, cried out on behalf of Best Houdini, on behalf of hundreds of seance circles that had been formed that night around the world, and for the millions more listening in on radio. His voice rang out in the darkness and pleaded with the ghost of Houdini to draw aside the veil and step once more into the material world that mankind could have this greatest of mysteries solved at last. But Houdini declined in appearance, and finally, Best Houdini spoke. Houdini did not come to this world to be working today. He's a regular on The Tonight Show, Ellen, Conan, and Comedy Central. 
He's also from that hit show, Cupcake Wars. Please put your hands together for Justin Moment. You laugh now, but 2,000 years ago, <laughs> for the start of religion. <laughs> Friends, I have a box. I put something inside the box, a prediction. In a moment, it'll be very important. Can we see the box? What's in the box? Okay, I want everyone in your head to think of, um, if you want to think of your first pet. Typically a happy memory, at least in the beginning. Go back to that moment, think of your pet. You look depressed all of a sudden, sir. We'll, we'll go past the, the VIPs here. Let's see, black shirt, black hair, you're thinking of your first pet? You look really happy about it. Is this, uh, are you thinking of your first pet? Okay. What's your name? Furreek. What kind of pet was your first pet? Uh, a cat, okay. What was your cat's name? Cream Puff. Cream Puff? <laughs> Cream Puff. Friday week, by the way, we're not friends, right? You bought a ticket, you're here. I don't, we're not Facebook friends. No? I don't follow you on Twitter, you don't follow me on Twitter? Okay, you should. But after the show. Um, cream Puff the cat. Would you be impressed if I pulled Cream Puff out of that box? Frederick? Is Cream Puff still. No? You might want to look away. Okay. <laughs> Wait for it. <coughs> Cream puff. Oh. You want to hold her? Give, give her to her. Give her to her. <laughs> for my next trick, I present to you the appearing wireless Bluetooth printer. Whoa! How does it work? <laughs> Spoiler, I'm sorry. I should do those two bits back to back. I haven't thought about that. Magic is easy, right? In 2015, just a tiny printer's magic is so easy, right? Like in Houdini's era, 100 years ago, if he wanted to do a prediction, which is the genre of trick that is, he obviously didn't have tiny printers, so I imagine he would have like used a slightly larger box and then had vests like lay in the box. And she'd hear him say, or hear you say cream puff, she'd scribble it out with a quill, I don't know. And uh, <laughs> he'd show it around. People would freak out. Can you imagine how amazing that would be? Because nobody would ever think he'd put his wife in his box, but I'm sure he would, right? <laughs> Often, right? These days, I, and I imagine, by the way, as a married couple, like, you know, if they got in an argument that day, she might mess up the name on purpose just to mess with them, you know? <laughs> Harry would never know what was going to come out of that box. Now I just have a guy in the sound booth with an iPad who's putting this out on the Wi-Fi connection. I'm killing time talking about you following me on Twitter. I don't need you to follow me on Twitter. I'm doing fine. <laughs> the, uh, doing magic is easier because of technology, but being a magician is way harder. Because, well, I mean, there's Google, so if you don't know how a trick works, you can Google it, which is the worst. Right? Like the great magicians of the past didn't have to deal with Google, Houdini, Blackstone, Jesus, like... <laughs> the secrets were safe. Just imagine Jesus turns water to wine as a guy in the back on his eye scroll. It's like... It's good quality. Like, that'd be the worst. We also have no attention span because of technology. Like, Houdini, like, how long was one of his average escapes? Like, when he was maybe, how, how long would the escape take? A jail escape, for example. Oh, it depends on if you move your Yeah? Like, half hour? One trick? Half hour? Jesus' is closer, it took three days. Like, I, I won't watch YouTube videos more than three minutes long. Like, that's the thing. 
And I've been up here for four minutes, I haven't done a trick yet. Like, here's the thing, you guys will only be impressed if you know there's no technology involved. That's it, you has to be legit old school, right? If there's no technology, we're impressed. Yes, can I get a yeah? Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Houdini novice, but I'm getting there. I caught the bug. Is it a Houdini bug? Sure. Uh, I don't look like a magician. I know I look like a, a Jewish Jonas brother. That's kind of my thing. <laughs> but uh, here's the thing. It's hard. Obviously, technology makes it hard being a magician in, in this age, but like, we're all very skeptical. Not just skeptics are skeptics. Like, everyone's skeptical. I had a woman, after the early show today, came up to me. She goes, hey, I know your magic is fake. And I was like, I know as well. <laughs> But she said it as if she thought I thought I was a wizard. And I'm not a wizard, okay? Uh, but just because the magic is fake doesn't mean it's not cool. So here's my mindset, and I always try to offer this metaphor. I believe that magic is like wrestling plants. Here we go. Okay? We all know they're fake, but when done well, can give you a feeling of true wonder. I'll show you what I mean. I need to borrow an iPhone. Does anybody have an iPhone that I can borrow? Is that an iPhone? Is it actually one? Yeah? Oh, fantastic. What's on it? Are you nervous to give it to me? Okay. What's your name? Lisa. Hi, Lisa. This is quick. Okay, balloon. Uh, Lisa's iPhone. Oh, your background is a cat. Is that... Is that cream? Is that... What? Maybe. Reincarnated. Okay, balloon. Oh. <laughs> That's it. That's a quick one. That's it. Thank you. No phones during the show. That's um. <laughs> what filter is that? Latex? That's a good music. At least that's how I practice safe text. Keep it in there. Keep it in there. You can't, you can keep it in, that's like a $40 case I just gave you. Like, so. <laughs> if you can keep it in there until the end of my set, I will reward you with a miracle, Lisa. You know? Are you expecting a call? <laughs> She's super pissed. Alright. Uh, this is an uh, envelope of mystery, ooh ha. Ooh -ha. Live in the moment, Lisa. <laughs> Seal the <laughs> seal the contents so they stay tamper proof. And I'm going to give this to a, a guardian. Hello, sir. How are you? Good. <laughs> okay. What's your name? Michael. Michael. You look like uh, you look like, you look like the dude. You look like the dude in vintage. Yeah, the dude. Are you Jeff Bridges? Okay. That would be really cool. Would you? I'm going to give this to you. Oh. Well, then, please, I'll come to you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. You're good. I'm perfect. I'm giving you, uh, by the way, I don't know if you were laughing at when I picked the box up before. I don't know what was in those good. Okay. That was a miracle. Would you uh, guard the envelope? I'll get back to it later. Don't let anybody take it. Deal? Okay. Be for All right. Lisa, you good? Huh? All right. Um, Here's a fantastic one here. In case there are little, you know, haunted spirits here in the theater, this is the mystery of the silver ball. Watch the silver ball. It gradually gets lighter until it's floating. That's a ladle. That's a soup ladle. I've debunked that. intellectual crowd. Uh, I should have closed with that. Uh, does anybody have one of these? Lisa, you have the iPhone 6. And congrats on that. Does anybody have the iPhone 5? Does anybody use this? 
Uh, but who uses it too much? Anybody uh, kind of outside the inner circle here who uses their phone a little too much, a little obsessed with it? This is a fake iPhone 5. Like you sell, they sell these on Amazon and just, uh, they're like from mall kiosks. Does anybody use this actual phone or close to it? Does anybody, this, I'm talking at you. Do you does anybody <laughs> use this phone too much? If, if your spouse uses the phone a little more than you'd like them to, you can kind of nudge their direction. Over here. Over here. Uh, how's it going? Do you, do you, is, do you have, are you an iPhone? Or? You're pointing at each other. You guys are meant to be. <laughs> What's your name, guy? Who's over here? No, I mean this guy was raising his hand. Oh, this guy. Where, which guy? Right here. Oh, with the. Uh, What's your name, sir? Bob. Bob. Do you use your phone too much? Or you're. Bob. All right. Do you have it with you? Yeah. In your hand? Of course you do. Would you join me? Come up here, Bob. Give Bob a round of applause. You can come this way. How's it going? Good. Welcome. Bob, Justin. Nice to meet you. We can trade you. You can check that one out. It's fake. This is Bob's. Oh my gosh, look at this. This is the dog. Is that your dog? Yeah. We are obsessed. Seriously. What's his name? Come over here. Okay, Bob. I'm going to put on airplane mode if that's cool. Okay, good. That's your phone. That's it. And the fake one, though. Doesn't it feel just like it? Like the same weight and everything? Stand on my left. We're going to play a game. Do you like games, Bob? What do you do? What's your thing? What's your passion? Fundraising. Fundraising. Okay. That's a game. Sometimes, right? Sometimes you win big and you don't, you don't even know why. What's your latest fund that you're raising funds for? Uh, animals. 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 I'm a pit bull guy. Okay. Animal rights is my guy. Okay. Uh, Bob, uh, I'm going to give you an envelope and your phone. I'm going to take an envelope and my fake phone. Would you put the phone inside the envelope? Don't lick the flap like a dingus and just shut it and kind of stick it shut. It should have a little double stick there. Good, look at that. So now we've got the two. And if we were going to play a game of like three shell, look at that. They look, you yeah. couldn't tell. It's like, but it's a 50-50 chance. Sure. That's too easy. Hold those. So I took four more fake phones and I put them in an envelope. So, We've got six, and I'm not good at math, but one out of six would be just, just Lisa, oh, your phone's over there. Okay, so one out of six. I'm gonna just pop this in here. Okay. Fun, huh? You can mix them up too, mix them up. So that you don't know what order they're in, I don't know what order they're in, your phone is somewhere in there. I'm gonna have you number the envelopes as well. Okay, so uh, you can use this big old marker here. <laughs> Done this before. <laughs> really big, uh, large numbers, one through six, if you could, on the envelopes. Okay. And are you a lucky guy? Like, do you consider yourself a lucky man? We consider lucky. Uh, are, you, are, you, are you happy? Yeah. Okay, good. I didn't want to get too deep. Um, uh, so we have we have six albums now. The international symbol for luck, and I'd say the oldest gaming device ever. You can Wikipedia is the dice. Singular, die, six sides, one, two, three, four, five, six, six envelopes. I'm going to have you roll the die, whatever number comes up, we'll eliminate that envelope. We do it five times until we're left with one envelope. If that envelope has Bob's phone in it, he gets to keep his phone. <laughs> this is a game of phones. <laughs> Three or five? Three. 
three or five. Both of you, three or five. Three or five. Three or five. Three or five. Six again. Keep going. Three or five. This where it gets a little repetitive. Still counts. Oh, two. We already did it. Three or five. Three or five. When the song ends, I smash them both. Three or five. You get to do this one. This is you. Here. Hope you feel it. Um, I have a confession. Um, I'm not a magician. <laughs> This is a social experiment about Americans' addiction to technology. You've taught us a lot, Lisa's taught us more. Um, if your phone's in there, cool. But if it's not in there, how cool for them that they were at the show with a guy, all right, go for it, I don't know. Reach in, click it, does it light up? Show it to him. Yeah. Holy crap, show it to his phone! Thank you. Bob, he's doing good work. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Lisa could have been worse. Seriously, Lisa. <laughs> I will relieve you. I'll take the phone back here. Lisa. Has it buzzed? Have you missed anything? She's refusing to speak to me. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. All right. By the way, Lisa, you just went, you know, 12 minutes without using your phone in 2015. That's commendable. That's something. Let's see what you missed. Mr. Kitty, cute. You have no passcode. See what you're up to. Um, you have a lot of apps, Lisa. What's your favorite app? What app do you use most on a daily basis? I'll look through your photos until you. <laughs> you're flexible, Lisa. Um, oh, you're, getting, you're getting a call from West Palm Beach. I'm going to decline. Okay. Um, okay. Is it okay? That would have been the worst. <laughs> He's been in West Palm all this time. Uh, they're calling again. They're calling again. Do you know who it is? All right. Okay. Harry, is it you? Harry. Okay, declining. Um, <laughs> the same belief, and, but nothing. Okay, Lisa, do you have the, do you use, my favorite app is the calculator app, I'm a numbers guy, I like numbers. Truth is in numbers, right? I was born July 11th at 7, 11 in the morning, weighing 7 pounds, 11 ounces. This is a true story. True story, and I love Slurpees, this is true. <laughs> Lisa, would you, do, do you want to, would you, would you join me on stage real quick? Or would you want to elect someone to be your proxy? Come on, give it for Lisa, she's coming to the stage. Come on, Lisa. Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Justin. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for helping me out. Well, thanks for the deadpan enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, the calculator app, do you have it? Oh, you do? I did. I'm impressed. Okay, we're going to make a number, a one-of-a-kind number for this evening. I will contribute to the equation by lucky number 7-Eleven. Okay, I'm going to hit times. I'm going to get, therefore, we're beginning an equation. Okay, I'm going to give you the phone. Don't hit clear or equals. That's important because we're going to multiply this up really big. But get the phone. Think of a small number in your head. It's either a one- or two-digit number, but it means something to you for a real reason. You think okay. one? Okay, hold the phone up right and carefully just type that number. Just the number. Perfect. Hit times just once. Boom. It gets bigger. I don't move. Let's see, uh, let's see, I don't know, uh, uh, gentleman on the aisle with glasses, what's your name? You, got it. yeah, Tony, point to somebody you don't know, real quick, point to somebody you don't know, this woman, hi, how are you? Ma'am, do you remember the house you first grew up in as a child? 
What was the street number on the mailbox? You don't remember? What's the last two digits of your phone number? No, no, nailed it. Okay, carefully type nine. Oh, perfect. Yeah, in hit times. Okay, would you point to somebody you don't know? It? Good. Glad you guys have been chatting before the show. Hello, sir. How are you? What's your name? Robin. Do you remember the house you grew up in as a child? Yes. Can I have the last four of your social? <laughs> The last four is eight four? <laughs> what is it? One eight eight four. Do you want to use the one eight or the eight four? Uh, the eight four. Okay, carefully type eight, four, times. And then can I have the first five of your social report? <laughs> it's for not for it's for a loan. <laughs> think of Lisa think of how old you were when you had your first kiss. Don't say the age, you carefully just type the age. <laughs> And then it equals your hussy. Now don't go. <laughs> this is good. Okay, we've been a large number of 311 million. Can, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna write this down. Will you read and dictate the number out loud for me, Lisa? Nice and loud. I'll transcribe it onto the board. One digit at a time. Good acoustics. Three. Three. One. 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 Comma. Zero. Okay, 311 million. Go for it. Zero. Zero. One. One. Five. 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 Yeah. Nine. Four. Four. Eight. Eight. Is it? Okay. Nine, eight, eight. Nine, 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 forty-eight. I'm gonna flash this to them, just to double check. Lisa, this is honestly your phone, right? For your chat. You did the math, okay? We even took numbers that mean something to you. I'm gonna leave this right here to create this big number that doesn't mean anything yet. Lisa, hold this like a mugshot. <laughs> Experience. I'm gonna grab the envelope. Thank you so much, sir. That has been held the entire time. No one's touched it, correct? Inside this envelope, I said I placed a message to be very important in a moment. So, 311,015,948, and my message that I wrote before the show is live in the moment. <laughs> Lisa, everybody, Lisa, that's for you. Thank you so much. And Lisa is not buying it. Okay. Lisa, this is the moment. The people in this room will never be the same people in the same room again, right? Beautiful October evening, the 31st. The 31st. 31st of October, which is the 10th month. So 31st of the 10th month. The year is 2015. And if you guys all look at your phones right now, you'll see it's exactly 9. Skeptic Magazine, a monthly columnist, yes, for the Scientific American and a professor at Chapman University. He's the author of a number of best-selling books including Why People Believe in Weird Things, The Believing Brain, and his latest book, The Moral Arc. Please put your hands together for Michael Sherman. Thank you so much for having me, and Robert, uh, Thanks for putting me on after the funniest act I've ever seen. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, actually, uh, let me have the house lights up for just a second. I'm going to ask a question. We heard a question earlier this morning, uh, earlier tonight. Are you, are you your brain, or do you have a brain? Okay, how many of you have a brain? 
Uh, okay, if you're not raising your hand, there's a psychiatric ward uh, here in San Francisco that we need to go to. Okay. This is actually the wrong question. The, the, the correct question is, 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 are you just your brain or are you your brain and there's something else out there? That is, are you a monist? You think there's just material stuff. Or are you a dualist? Do you think that there's the material stuff and something else? Some, whatever you want to call it, some spiritual stuff or soul stuff or something like that. Okay. So how many of you think that there is, you're a dualist? You would be a dualist. How many are dualists here? Okay, wow. This is not going to be a Ben Carson rally. <laughs> Mostly monists. Okay, that's good. Because <laughs> uh, that is actually the scientific perspective. And uh, really what we're getting at here with all these discussions of, uh, of contacting the dead, talking to the dead, and so on, is, is there something more than the material world? That's what we're after. That's what we want to know. Is there an afterlife? And uh, when I'm asked this, I always give the same answer. Um, I'm for it. Uh, but the fact that I'm for it doesn't mean it's true. There's a lot of things I would like to be true that, well, they're not. Check my 401k. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so what we want to know is, is it real or not? You know, what, what does the evidence show? So there are plenty of dualists in the sciences, but most scientists, particularly most neuroscientists, are monists. They think that you are just your brain. And uh, so we have to look at what's the overwhelming evidence, one direction or the other. Uh, now, so most dualists do not deny you need a brain. They'll make an argument something like, well, a radio has to have the signals coming to it to work. The signals need the radio to transmit the signals that their message that they're carrying and so on. You need both. Uh, but what is the equivalent of the radio transmitters that we know are out there transmitting radio signals for consciousness, for your thoughts? We know, we know of no such thing. On the other hand, we know plenty about how the brain works. We know, for example, that there's a little spot here in your temporal lobe called the fusiform gyrus, which if you touch with electrodes, it stimulates uh, your ability to see faces. And if you have damage to this area from stroke or, or cancer or, or injury, uh, people get face blindness. They can't see faces anymore. And, and it's like this for all of the brain. We know from mapping the brain through, initially at McGill University, through touching parts of the brain with uh, electrodes when uh, patients are being uh, uh, operated on, you get, you get their permission at a time, is it okay if we wake you up, after we cut through all the stuff that feels pain and then get to the brain that doesn't feel pain and then poke around and ask you questions and they say yes, sir. And, and you do that and, and, and you can map the brain this way and you can tell exactly what's going on. In, in all the different parts. So we know the visual cortex is back here. We know lots of areas in the temporal lobe. If you stimulate, people have near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, sense presences, transcendent feelings, hearing the voices of angels and gods and things like that. And uh, so as we um, sort of look at these different lines of evidence, for example, uh, oxygen deprivation causes certain uh, experiences people have, such as floating out of their bodies or a tunneling effect. Uh, we know that uh, if you take certain hallucinogenic drugs, they will predictably produce vibrant colors and fantastic sounds and angelic voices and things like this. Now, your particular trip will be unique to you, but we know that if you take ayahuasca or whatever, you will have some kind of fantastic trip. So we know that these artificial neurotransmitter substances produce something like what real neurotransmitter substances do of these mind-like or or psychedelic type experiences. So as we pile through all these different lines of inquiry, the evidence begins to add up. You are your brain, and that is all you are. And you also know this if you just think about it intuitively. People that get uh, Alzheimer's disease or senility or dementia, as their neurons die, everything shrinks. Not just the brain, but the memory shrinks, handwriting shrinks, gait shrinks your personality shrinks, everything disappears with the brain. So as I like to say to my friend Deepak Chopra, you know, where does Aunt Millie's mind go when her brain dies of Alzheimer's? Now Deepak says it returns to the state where it used to be in the quantum consciousness and the universe and all that stuff, but to which I think, well, where is that? And can I upload it 
you know, and put it on my CD and, and put it back in my brain. No, uh, of course not. We don't know of anything like that. Uh, so uh, when we're faced with two hypotheses like this, we have to decide which one has the most evidence. It's clear. The monistic position is the one that's most likely. Okay, so what does this have to do with the afterlife? Well, the afterlife is very much wrapped up in, in, our, in, in your soul stuff. Well, what is that? You have the operation to define a soul. Well, that's your memories, your personality. You, the essence of you. So if there's no medium to put it on out there somewhere, uh, when, it's, when the medium that, that carries it now, your neurons, is gone, then, then your soul is gone. That, that's, that's it. That's what we know. Now, I have to say that there are people attempting to solve this problem scientifically. Uh, you probably heard about brain uploading. You can upload your brain onto a computer. Uh, well, we're a long ways from this. We, we, we ran an article in Skeptic Magazine, when will uh, computers achieve human level intelligence and consciousness and so on? Uh, and the conclusion was, is we're 10 years away, and always will be. <laughs> uh, it turns out this is a super hard problem to solve. Much harder than the Human Genome Project by many, many orders of magnitude. Uh, you know, you've probably heard the meme about, you know, 2030. 2030 is the, the time you're going to make it. If you just make it to 2030, uh, and if you don't think you're going to make it to 2030, you can be chronically frozen. Uh, but if you do, then you can, okay, so I don't think we're even close to 2130, 2530, 3130. I think it's, it's a much harder problem than this. But the point is, whatever the medium is, if you, if you can't do that, um, then, then, then there's no transmission of the soul. So. To those who believe in the afterlife, religious uh, believers or whatever, the question from our, anybody's reasonable perspective is, how does it work? Where do you go? Uh, by the way, how old are you when you're there? <laughs> and one answer, by the way, from one religious sect is 39. <laughs> Apparently this is the perfect age to be. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, you know, so we're sort of faced with this, well, well then what? You know, what, what, what have we got? Um, and so, um, well, okay, then there's long-term things, like the, the, the singularity, when, when computers become us, and so forth, or the whole universe becomes a virtual reality, and then we're all resurrected. Okay, now at this point, we're just in science fiction. And science fiction is fine, it's fun, but again, we come back to, what does the science say? We, we really want to know what's actually true, instead of what we would like to be true. And so, um, uh, I think when we reflect upon this at the end, um, that is, we want to know what's, what's really true, and though, although it's possible there is this other world, uh, the problem we have is the same problem that uh, Carl Sagan talked about in his great work, Demon Haunted World. He's got a chapter in there called, uh, I have a dragon in my garage. And you say, wow, you have a dragon in your garage, that's really cool. Show it to me. So they open the garage and you go, he goes, oh, I can't see it. Oh, well, <clears throat> the dragon's invisible. Oh, okay. Well, hey, listen, let's put some powder on the floor and we'll get its footprints. And you see the dragon floats above the ground a couple of inches, so it doesn't leave footprints. All right, well, I got this heat detector. Well, you see, it's a cold dragon. It doesn't give off any heat. Yeah, but when the dragon spits flames, then I'll have this detector that detects flames. Well, it's cold fire. It, it's, it's cold fire. Okay, you, you sort of see where this goes. At some point, what's the difference between an invisible, heatless dragon that floats and a non-existent dragon? Okay, you can apply this to pretty much any supernatural or paranormal phenomenon. At some point, you've got to have some line of evidence. So you can say, well, I think consciousness and the soul exist out there somewhere and has something to do with quantum physics. Yeah, but at some point, you've got to have the footprints the heat detection, you know, some kind of evidence. All of the evidence that we have points to you're just your brain, and that's it. it is, that, is that such a small thing? No. And I'll close with this little poem from Matthew Arnold called Empedocles on Etna, which I ended that chapter in my book, Why People Believe Weird Things. Uh, is it so small a thing to have enjoyed the sun, to have lived light in the spring, to have loved to have thought, to have done. To have advanced true friends and beat down baffling foes. That we must feign a bliss of doubtful future date. And while we dream on this, lose all our present state and relegate to worlds yet distant. 
our repose. Thank you. Now, a lot of people go into making an event like this happen. Uh, they're going to set up for the magical seance behind me. Um, a great big thank you to Tucker Hyatt. He was made today awesome. Uh, David, Lace, uh, David and Kathy, may I get house lights for a moment, please? I'm going to come into your space and do something out there while they set something up on the table. And see if we can actually make contact for the other side. Hello everyone. Hi, long, I know, long night, it's Halloween. You're the mission, things are about to get weird. <laughs> Hi, have we ever met before? What's your name? Nicole, it's nice to meet you. Would you come up on stage? I'm uh, not stage, we're gonna go like right in front. A big round of applause for Nicole, everybody. <laughs> Watch your step, Nicole. Hi. Oh, just put that down. Hi, Nicole. Uh, what do you do for a living? You're a nurse. Thank you for being a nurse. Um, Nicole, I'd like you to place your hands facing me like so. Okay. In a moment, I'm going to touch you very gently on your hands. Okay. You're going to count how many times you feel a touch, but do not count out loud. You're going to do this with your eyes closed, but not yet. Audience, I want you to watch very closely, especially the inner circle. I want you to count how many times you see me actually touch your hands, not come close, okay? Count to yourselves. Look into my eyes, take a deep breath, close your eyes, breathe out, keep breathing naturally, close your eyes, all the way close. Start counting. Open your eyes. Not wind, not air, not breath from my mouth, but an actual gentle touch on your hands. How many did you feel? Seven. Say that louder. Seven. You said seven. How many did you see? <laughs> so I, I did a little research on Houdini, and there are basically five pillars, in my opinion, of the life of Houdini, and we want to represent all of them here tonight. Magic and escapes. He's an innovator. We had Justin Willman. He's a skeptic. We had skeptics here talking about that. Uh, he's a historian. We had John Cox here. I don't know if you know this, but he was an avid historian. And uh, also, he was the first internationally known star. Everybody all around the world knew of Harry Houdini. It is 89 years later, and you all know Harry Houdini. And that's what, the reason we got Justin Woman here, because he has 110,000 followers on social media. So, <laughs> he represents that. <laughs> and now, for our magical seance. In a moment, you'll meet a man who's an anthropologist, magician, and mentalist. He's an expert in his field and has appeared on several TV networks, including the History Channel, a &E, HBO, Hallmark, Travel Channel, HGTV. Some of his recent TV appearances include Hell's Kitchen, Palm Stars, Ghost Adventures, Mind Freak, and House Hunters. He has lectured at Yale, UCLA, at Apple's headquarters, the world-famous Magic Castle, and the Magic Circle in London. Please put your hands together for Paul Draper. So here, let's test out our Houdini experts first. Does anybody here know the song that Houdini had played while he did the water torture escape? Asleep in the deep, absolutely. See, Houdini understood the, uh, the stories of, of the time, a popular song of the time about two lovers that are out on a cruise ship, out on a ship together, and the ship sinks and they both drown together while he hangs upside down in water. <laughs> The uh, Houdini, uh, Houdini died uh, in the year 1926 at the age of 52, and 52 years later, on Halloween night, I was born. <laughs> That's true. And uh, I'd like to share with you the song, Asleep in the Deep. May I sing it for you? Yeah. It goes like this. Stormy the night and the waves roll high, bravely the ship doth ride. Hark how the lighthouse bells solemn cry, ring o'er the swollen tide. 
There on the deck, see two lovers stand, heart to heart beating and hand in hand. Though death be near, she knows no fear, while at her side is her love ever dear. Melodramatic, yes. Lovely the bells in the old tower ring, beating hostilist for the warning it brings. Sailor, take care, sailor, take care. Danger is near me. Beware, 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 beware. Many brave hearts are asleep in the deep, so beware, beware. <laughs> so now, we take you back in time to the recreation of the Victorian seance. I'm a cultural anthropologist, and when 9-11 happened, I wasn't able to go study the Pentagon of Southern Iran. So instead, I went and spent time with spiritualists in New Orleans, and I studied what they did so that I could come to understand their powers and their skills. But we start with a power that was described earlier today. I'm now going to show you something you've never seen before. Are you ready? 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 Spoons! <laughs> What, you've seen these before? <laughs> this works much better in your own. <laughs> two, <laughs> two metal spoons. They nest together as if they are... One. Spooning, really? <laughs> one person is like spooning. That's why I don't bring forks. <laughs> if you get that joke, whose fault is it really? Here we are, two metal spoons, two metal spoons. Let me come down to the audience. These are not teaspoons, these are not tablespoons, these are serving spoons. Two metal serving spoons here. Uh, let's see, who will help me out, who will help me out? Hi there, what's your name? Pidge. Pidge, that's a lovely name, Pidge. Two metal spoons, check those out, make sure they're metal, they're solid, they are, as they appear to be. Come up here, give Pidge a round of applause. Give Pidge! <laughs> Pidge, where are you from? Pacifica. Pacifica, what are you passionate about? Theater, welcome. You can now add this to your resume. You are on this stage. Here, stand right over here if you would, Pidge. Pidge, you look lovely. You're, you're kind of, uh, you're, you're kind of, uh, oh yes, I see all, all the colors and loveliness here. Art Deco on your outfit. Two metal spoons. They don't bend in your hand. They don't melt at your fingertips. They're solid steel. They nest together perfectly. One of these two is going to bend in your hand. Which one, Pidge? Pick me, pick me. Oh, how easily swayed Pidge is. How easily swayed. No, 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 whichever one you want. <laughs> Fine, take it. Here, take this, don't bend it. Hold on to that. Don't bend it. Here we are. Hold that at the tips of your fingers up here. Shake it back and forth. Imagine it's bending. Ever so slight. Just a little bit. A little bit. These skeptics are throwing me off. They're like, no. They're just like, Stop, 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 stop. I don't know if you can tell. You didn't bend yours, did you? There's now just a slight difference between those. Here, let me show you. I don't know if you can tell, Pidge, but there's now just a slight difference. Can you see that? Here, Pidge, take uh, one hand and place it on top of mine, one hand underneath. One on top, one underneath. Whew. Am I putting enough pressure on that to bend steel? No. It's going to start to bend in between our hands, Pidge. Do you see it bending? Yes. That's weird, isn't it? That's <laughs> weird. The spirits must be with us. Pitch. I don't know if they can tell in the back. I don't know if they can tell in the back. But there's, there's, now, there's now just a slight difference between those two spirits. Stay. There's so much gravity on this planet, Pitch. The, uh, now, Pitch, that's an old joke. Pitch, take one finger, put it right there, rub back and forth the channel. It's going to roll up towards you. You see that? It likes you. You're making up your own jokes. Come on. <laughs> That's 90 degrees. That's 90 degrees. I'm breaking a sweat. A lot of people think that I take and put enormous uh, pressure on it when no one's looking. So this time I won't even touch it. Ready? Three, two. Oh, I see. Now you like it. I like the front row response was. Shh. That was fussy. 
<laughs> Hold on that pitch. That's solid, right? That's a solid metal spoon, right? She, she, uh, she might be acting. Here we are. Let's have, let's have this guy. Here, go there. Pull on that. That's a solid piece of metal, right? Let go. Solid piece of metal. And yet, and yet still, just a little wiggle, just like this. Wave over the throat. Right? <laughs> now, you're right. With enough pressure, you can bend a piece of steel. But there's no place that's cut into my hands, no place that's dug into my flesh. But you can, you can't, right? Rah! Strong landing surface, bend steel. But only in the matrix can you do this. Pinch, watch real close. Do you see what's happening there, Pinch? What's going on? The metal's twisting. I don't know if you can tell in the back, but that's twisted like a corkscrew. That will never be straight again. That's changed to a crystalline level. It's fractured and splintered inside. Strongest man on earth can't straighten that out, Pidge. But you can still stir your hot drinks or eat your cereal with it. That now belongs to you. Give a round of applause. Pidge. Now, Pidge, would you take one of these seats around the table? I'll have you sit down and we'll start our, start our seance tonight. I have another experiment I'd like to try. Another experiment I'd like to try. I have a couple of newspapers here. We'll see if the psychic energy is among you. Among you. I have the Examiner and the uh, Weekly. These are called newspapers. <laughs> They're something that existed in the time of Houdini. If I could have a little house lights in the audience. I'm going to throw this paper ball in the audience. If this paper ball comes hurling towards your head, please catch it. Okay? Somebody catch it. Who's got it? Excellent. Grab it. Would you like to use the examiner or the weekly? The examiner. The examiner. Okay. Toss them all to somebody else. Stay. Somebody grab it. Somebody grab it. Hi there. I'm going to start going through the pages. Anytime you want, you say stop. I've already swayed you. You couldn't have chosen the first two. That one right there? Or did you, that one? Okay. Toss the ball to somebody else. Keep going. Keep going. Hi there. Hi there. I'm going to tear it in half. Do you want the, uh, the, the smaller piece or the bigger piece with the dangly bit? The bigger piece with the dangly bit. All right. Good, good. That's too dirty for some places. Here, toss that to somebody else. Toss it to Go ahead. Hi there. Excellent catch. Would you like the piece up high or down low? Let the spirits guide you. Down low, down low. That's what there are words on both sides. Big as fall. Toss someone else. Toss someone else. Let the spirits guide you. Do you want the one closer to you or further from you? Closer to you. This one. Okay, toss to someone else. Hi there. Do you want do you want the one that looks like Montana or the one that looks like I don't know, Colorado? <laughs> Colorado, it's a drug reference. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep, I'm, going to come, I'm going to come down to the audience so that I can walk among you. Uh, toss to somebody else. Toss to somebody else. Hi there. I love your dress. If you were to stand, will you stand up for just a second? If we could hit her with a spotlight, we would light up this room. It would be amazing. Okay. <laughs> now, do you, want, do you want the one in my right hand or the one in your left hand? No, 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 no. Either one, either one. With, with my left, you're not going to take the force. How nice of you. Toss to somebody else. Toss to somebody else. Toss to somebody else. Toss to somebody else. To Basil. Basil. From the cabin. Merlin. Okay, well, let's do it. Let's do it. Would you, would you like the, the, one, the one up high that I'm wiggling or the one down low that's staying stationary? The one down low. The one down low. Not going to take it. Or should you toss again? Toss again. Last choice. Last choice. Last choice. Last choice. Who has it? Who has it? Mr. Mr. Vastman. You're not. Are you a magician? The magicians freak me out. Toss to somebody else. You ruined my energy. You ruined my energy, magician. Hi. Hi. Well, hi there. What's, what's your name, Beret Lady? Michelle. Your your favorite song is Michelle. My Bell. No, pick the job. No, Michelle. I like your outfit there. Would you? Which one would you like? Last choice. She gets to choose. This one right here. Would you stand up? I'm going to have you take that. I'm going to have you come up and help me. Would you do that? Give Michelle a round of applause. Thank you, Michelle. Come and help me. Michelle. Come and help me. Uh, Michelle. Michelle, this way. Where are you from, Michelle? From here. From here. It's a nice place. 
Come on up. It's been open since 1926, Michelle. Michelle. Everybody. Everybody that. Uh, everybody that uh, uh, made a choice as we tore down the papers, one little slip. And we came down to one final slip that you chose. I want you to look at either side and see if there's a word that jumps at you. Not a name or a noun, but a word, an action word, something fun, exciting. Anything jump out at you? What is it? Sure. Secret. Secret. Wrong sheet of paper. Um, <laughs> could we? Uh, secret. Secret. If I could have guided you with my spirit meaning to make all those choices down to one word, and that one word was secret, that would be pretty amazing, right, Michelle? Yeah. There's a, there's a paper ball that went around the room, and everybody that made a choice held on to it. Where is it? And you have it. Okay, and there's not another paper ball over there. Where you, no, <laughs> that's the one. The uh, inside here is written one word, and one word only. And that word is a secret. Round of applause. Take that, Michelle. Grab a seat over here at the seance table. Grab a seat over here at the seance table. All right. I need some more. I'm going to sit in that seat there, Michelle. Grab another one. I'm going to sit there, so grab another one. Let's grab uh, a couple more people. Who else wants to sit at the seance table? Who else wants to play? Let's have, let's have right here, would you come and play mess? Would you come up and play mess with a, with a wild hair, a crazy makeup? That's absolutely it. Bold battles and fans. If you were right here, beard on man. Excellent. Pass back here. Would you come? We have people pointing at you. That's lovely. Back here, uh, alien pumpkin head. I love that. Let's see, uh, let's see, how many do we have? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We're going to do one more crunch from back here. Who do we have? We have a redhead guy come down here. Give him a round of applause for you, Greg. Yay! It's, uh, it's dangerous making my life a choice to be a red since they have no soul. Um, <laughs> you put him out of the sun too long, he's going to burst into flames. All right, we're going to grab a couple more chairs. Can I grab one more? I'm gonna, I'll sit right here with you. Yeah, great. Great, great, great. Grab a couple more. Grab a couple more. Excellent. Right there. One more, one more. I'll, I'm going to sit next to you. Uh, let's sit between you. If you sit over there, I'm going to sit between the two of you. Great, no, no, no. Come back, come back. I love you, R2-D2. I wrote... <laughs> what? Do we don't have more chairs? Then, I believe in you. <laughs> I believe in you. Okay, fine. Okay, I'll sit on this. So, I'll stand in one <laughs> Look how tall I am. <laughs> now, <sighs> we're going into a seance here. We're going to try and contact the other side. We have one more task to do before we start the darkness with some ESP cards. Are you familiar with ESP cards? You're familiar with cards. Did you ever see the original Ghostbusters movie? Excellent. The way this works, I have a circle and a wavy line. This is for them. You're just watching, perverts. The, uh, this is square, a plus, a star. The way this works, I have the same symbol. Circle, bacon, square, plus, Star. If you get this right, everybody's going to be happy. If you get this wrong, there are electrodes under all these chairs. You're going to get a terrible zap. Take one of those two piles. Take and mix it up. Okay, take and mix it up. Did you find another chair? Oh, you're so good. Bring it on over. Bring it over. Excellent. It's, a, it's another school, just slightly smaller. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, uh, what do doctors call a slightly smaller stool? <laughs> okay, the, uh, here we go. So I'll set one card face down. Whatever card you think that is, put face up on top of it. You can look at yours. You can look at yours. You need to be psychic. Test the room. Sense the energy. She says it's a circle. Do you really think it's a circle? Did you grab, just grab it random? You really think it's a circle? What do you think that one is? What do you think that was? Star. They keep bringing more chairs. This is great. Eventually, 
<laughs> yes, 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 yes. Oh, I get short. The, uh, <laughs> this is the one with Houdini in it, right? The, uh, <laughs> the world is getting bigger. The, okay, look. You put down three cards. I'm left with the, with the plus and the square so far. If she's doing this right, she should be left with the plus and the square too. Hold up what you have. How you doing? Plus and square, plus and square. Good, good. Next one. Next one. Last one. Set those down. Turn what do you think there. Okay, good. Do you want to change your mind? No. She made every choice. You have to verify. She said that the top one here is a plus, which it is. The next one there is a square, which it is. You all saw that. And before that, she chose star, wavy, and circle. Star, wavy, and circle. The top one is a star. The next one is the wavy. And the bottom one she put down is the circle. Give her a round of applause. The spirit made you get this. A pair of handcuff keys, check those out. A pair of handcuffs, try and pull on those. Those don't open without the key. Try and pull the bottom ones. Try and pull the bottom ones. That doesn't open without the key. No? We'll set it right there. A couple of chalkboard slates. A couple of chalkboard slates like we were talking about earlier. Blank on both sides. Here, tap that side. Tap the side. Good, good, good. That side. Good, that side. So good, that side. All solid slates. School chalkboard slates so the spirits can give us more than just a rap so that they can give full words, sentences as they reach out from beyond. I'm going to entrust, uh, let's, let's entrust uh, De Diaz Muerte here, Day of the Dead, with it. I'll, I'll, set this, uh, I'll set this piece of chalk in between them, all right? So I'll hand this to you. Let me come, I'll come over to you. Do, do, do. Piece of chalk. Piece of chalk. Take the piece of chalk and place it between the two slates. Place it in there. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Hold on to the slates. Hold on to them. Don't let anyone get those. You, you may in a moment have to put your elbows on them. Now, as we go into the sands, as we go into the darkness, we need to hold hands to create a circle of safety. Do not break this circle because the other side is right here with us. They're just beyond the veil, standing here among us, wanting to enter us, wanting to speak through us. This circle protects us, and if you release these hands, they will be able to enter. They will be able to speak through you, and I don't have the skills to make them leave. So stay with me. <laughs> it's going to become dark here, Mom. If, uh, if in the total darkness you need us to bring up the lights, if you need us to bring up the lights, please clap three times in the audience. Clap three times, uh, big and loud, so, so that I know to bring the lights up. If you are scared of the dark and can't allow this to go into darkness, you may want to leave now. Is there anyone we need to leave? You can clap if you do. Excellent. Thank you for staying. Everyone holding hands? Yes? You have the slate secure? Excellent. All right. Into the darkness we go. Concentrate with me. Turn out the lights. Concentrate with me. Houdini, come back to us. Come back to us, Houdini. Speak to us from beyond. Reach out from the other side. Lift this table, Houdini. Lift this table. Do you feel the table levitating? Lift it higher and higher. Drop it, Houdini, if you're here. Speak to me. I hear the words, Das Wach du da. Das Wach du da. What does that mean? Glauben. 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 Is Bess with you? Is your mother with you? Who is here with you? We come on this night to this stage to speak to you, Houdini, to reach out to you, Houdini, so we can sense you here. Reach out among us. Let us know that you're here with us, Houdini. Anyone? Turn on the lights. Are we holding hands? Holding hands. Release your hands. Did anything happen? Did you sense anything? Did you feel anything? What happened? What happened? 
How high? That high? But sideways? Which way? This way. That way. But this high, how high was it on your side? It was there. Yeah. Still rose. So if I would have lifted it from here, it wouldn't have risen. Did anyone touch those slates? No. Will you hand them to me? As a group? Yeah. The chalk rolled. The chalk tried to escape. It ripped out. Did you feel? Did you feel the chalk moving underneath you? But no one reached in. No one touched it. What does it say? We are here. <laughs> I think we may have made contact tonight with someone. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Graber. Keep your seats. I'll be right up. Halloween, and hopefully we made Sydney Rout Radner proud. Mm. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone.